Black Patriarch. Human capital theory has become a major theoretical construct for understanding a country or community's profound socioeconomic changes and for strategizing how to spur creation of wealth. Basically, human capital is everything inside of a worker's head. A person's stock of basic intelligence, experiences both in and out of the workplace, education, work habits, trainings received, social and personality attributes, energy level, judgment, trustworthiness, initiative, and creativity embody the ability to perform labor so as to produce economic value. These resources are the total capacity of the people that represent a form of wealth which can be directed to accomplish the goals of the nation or state or a portion thereof. Horace Mann is referred to as the father of human capital theory and developed the theory that the economic value of people is based on their educational achievements, skills, and knowledge. He believed that investing in one's education would improve the quality of workers and therefore increase the wealth of the community. Horace Mann contended that schooling would ultimately end poverty. Tokyo, crowded subways and cluttered streets, fused with neon chaos. Business-like order and efficiency. Ancient traditions rubbing shoulders with the ultra-modern. With their wealth and independence, it's the youth of Tokyo who drive a lot of the economy. Often living with their parents, with a high income and few financial commitments, they prowl the streets, poised to throw their paycheck at the latest fashion fad. Driven by its huge population and frenzied economy, Tokyo is constantly under construction. Few buildings are older than 25 years. The result is a cityscape that can feel like the set of a science fiction film. Underlining all of this is the trap of bad governance, and it just seems to compound all the other traps. 30 or 40 years ago, most of the developing world is badly governed. And the, the classic example is China. But China managed to turn around dramatically, completely reversing its policies. The reason it was able to do so, and India the same, was these are big societies in which there are a lot of educated people, in which there are a lot of educated people. Now by the time you get to the countries of the bottom billion, like something like the Central African Republic, yeah, there's just a handful of educated people. The society isn't training very many, and a lot of the ones who are trained leave. And so there just isn't a critical mass that can have the confidence to diagnose a problem and implement change. And so the societies of the bottom billion 
reformed much more slowly than the successful societies. The delta is an area of approximately 27,000 square miles in southern Nigeria, where the Niger River meets the Gulf of Guinea. And it's the source of the country's vast oil wealth. Nigeria, as a government, does not know how much crude oil is lifted in Nigeria today. Here, you're as likely to fill up your car from an illegal oil stand on a street corner as you are from a gas station. Nigeria is a big, huge country. Economically, it's a huge market. Nigeria is the sixth largest producer of, um, of crude oil um, and uh, I think third or fourth uh, producer of natural gas. Nigeria exports millions of barrels of oil per day and almost all of it comes from the Delta. This has created a contrasting region of those who have tapped into the oil money and those who haven't. There aren't a lot of options for work. Corruption and theft has leached away the Delta's resources. If you're lucky, you can scrape together a living, filling tires on the side of the road for 50 cents apiece. Like, let's take Detroit, Michigan, and the recent reports from the Pew Foundation, the U.S. Census. They showed them pretty clearly that they ranked all the cities, the urban cities in the United States. The 10 poorest cities ranked three months ago in the entire United States. The 10 poorest cities, the 10 most dangerous cities, with the highest home foreclosure rates, with the highest high school dropout rates, with the highest imprisonment rates, Guess what they were? Cities where black folk are the majority populations. Detroit led the list in every category. In a city that's 85 to 90% black and Arabs own 90% of the businesses. In a city that's 85 to 90% black and Arabs own 90% of the businesses. clearly an underemployed class of black men right. um, who have not necessarily gone to jail, um, may have only s completed a certain level of school, mm -hmm. maybe only had a certain level of training. How do we deal with this underemployed class of black men um, that aren't dealing with the same kind of challenges but some nuanced ones? Because I would bet that there is an opportunity there that sometimes we're just missing. Yeah, and I, and I don't think we're doing as good a job as we could focusing on what we are doing, on where the job are and where they're going. Mm -hmm. So we talk about STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. You know, not to say that there's anything wrong with targeting uh, construction trades or manufacturing jobs or the like, but we all know those jobs not only are gone, but they're right. not coming back. But we all know those jobs not only are gone, but they're right. not coming back. Right. They're not coming back.
According to the U.S. Census Bureau, there are an estimated 2.6 million black-owned businesses in the U.S. Roughly 10% or 260,000 are construction firms. For the next few minutes, we'll discuss efforts to grow these businesses. When we talk about construction <clears throat> jobs specifically, though, what is it about that arena that's so attractive to people? Well, it's a job maker to begin with, and there's a lot of heritage uh, from when we were slaves in, in the South. We did the construction for the South. We built the buildings, built the roads, and so now the great-grandchildren and great-great-grandchildren of those uh, uh, carpenters and such have the craft and they put it to use. This is a condo, very expensive, half million, million dollar uh, units. Across from Marcus Garvey Park. Harlem is changing. Widely considered the historic cultural capital of black America, the neighborhood situated in New York City's upper Manhattan area looks very different today from its life in previous decades. Where there were once crumbling tenement housing complexes and a critical lack of infrastructure and services, there now stand luxurious new condominiums and a variety of upscale urban amenities. The cityscape is not the only thing that has changed in Harlem. The population is looking increasingly wealthier and wider as newcomers continue to move to the neighborhood, while previous residents find themselves moving out as housing prices and the cost of living skyrocket. Harlem community activist Nellie Hester Bailey says the neighborhood's experience with gentrification raises important questions about who benefits most from urban economic revitalization. Well, when you redevelop houses uh, in any housing, of course it's good. The issue is why, and, and, and this is a standard reply of so many old timers in Harlem, why is it that the development here was only worthwhile when whites moved in. Why didn't we see this? Why was this not done for us? Why were we allowed to live in the misery of drug infections and vacant lots uh, that, were, uh, that was littered with uh, uh, glass and, and, and garbage and, and needles? And I think that's a legitimate question. And uh, it's, it's, it's fair for one to ask what undergirds all of this, uh, this public policy and legislation, if it's not race and class. money like the budget how many you know billions and trillions of dollars we have in a budget so and nobody asked like well how you, where you gonna find that money we got the money we got the money so don't tell me we don't have the money and I ain't gotta figure out I'm not an accountant I'm not your account I don't have to figure out like how, how's he gonna pay for this no you said you're gonna pay for it Bernie when you get in there you figure out how to pay for it we're not we're, and when you don't have anything that's what you do like we don't have black people don't have money we don't have wealth when you don't have money and you don't have wealth that's what you do you say you figure it out if you promise out if, if somebody promises you if somebody comes to your house tomorrow and you don't have anything to eat and they say i'm gonna buy you groceries you don't say well where are you gonna get the money from where you work at you just say go get me groceries <laughs> i'm hungry that's all you say yes. <laughs> this is insane
most Americans think about when they think of Sweden? Music, the Muppets, maybe. But I'd put my money on something else. The iconic Swedish model. Whenever they profile the Swedes, they always seem to be so happy and beautiful. Compared to most other nations, Sweden is a success story. But why is Sweden successful? Many credit Sweden's generous welfare state and progressive policies with creating a standard of living that is among the best in the world. Can the rest of the world learn from Sweden? If, you, if you're willing to, yes. Many think we should be more like them. If an American would tell me that, you know, the U.S. should be more like Sweden, uh, I would say I don't think it's possible. Dr. Charlotta Stern is a sociologist at Stockholm University. The U.S. is a very diverse society, whereas Sweden is, is or at least has been up to modern times, very homogenous. Uh, people have looked the same, had the same religion, they speak the same language. Some people feel that Sweden grew rich because of social democracy or labor unions, but that's not the reason uh, Sweden grew rich. Sweden grew rich like any country that is rich, through well-functioning capitalist institutions. Sweden grew rich like any country that is rich, through well-functioning capitalist institutions. Well-functioning capitalist institutions, work, uh, trade, innovation. That, says Berg, is what transformed the poverty-stricken Sweden of the late 19th century into one of the world's richest nations. One of the things that I'm, I really realize about this wealth is we don't understand timing as well. So when I say timing as wealth, we don't understand what just happened as far as a major shift in terms of new people getting into any kind of money. The kind of shift we saw has consolidated wealth. And when they say wealth, is, it means that there's not going to be new chances to come from the mailroom and become the CEO. That's done. And we got to get honest about that. Um, Malcolm Gladwell, and I want everybody reading this, listening to this, to maybe go pick it up, Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell. He did this this analysis, and what he showed is, I'm going to share this. Is Bill Gates a billionaire? He probably wouldn't have started Microsoft if he hadn't been born in 1955. That made Gates old enough to take advantage of the opportunity that opened up with the introduction in 1975 of the Altor 8800, the first do-it-yourself computer kit. But he wasn't so old to be settled in his life and not take a leap of faith. Also, his father was a was one of the best trademark attorneys in Seattle. What you're looking so on, a, and then they continue on. They say coincidence. Microsoft co-founder Paul Allen was born in '53. Apple founder Steve Jobs was born in '55, and Sun Microsoft Systems founder Bill Joy was born in '54. So, like you're looking at whiteness, wealth, and timing. You're looking at whiteness, wealth and timing not just coding and like they make bill gates sound like he came from compton or zuckerberg Dude, folks his daddy was the number like one of the top trademark attorneys in seattle you put that with his computer thing he was ahead of the game and so like was he a billionaire already no and so like but how how like if you have that kind of like access and nobody else does putting it all together i guess has value even president obama has admitted this with his recent quote where he said do you want to read i mean that quote is so powerful he basically says that i'm tired of successful people acting like luck isn't part of it and luck is a huge part of it the thing that i would like to get through to black people is that 
Stop thinking that your desire and your, you know, to be great is bigger than the institutions and the bigger than the structures that exist in this country. Like these people are wealthy, not because they were just go getters. Oh, I see all this crap online about, you know, here are 20 things you can do to be a to be a rich person. He, he act like rich people. You know, start, 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 start. You know, get up at this time and you stay up to this time and you check email at this time. No, that's not that's not that's not how to get rich. Rich people didn't do that. That is what the book is about. The subtitle of The Bell Curve is uh, Class Structure in America, Intelligence and Class Structure in American Life. And that, what you, that paragraph you just read captures the essence of what Dick Kernstein and I were trying to talk about. And that is that over the course of the 20th century, there was a, a gradual, <clears throat> almost invisible, but crucial change in the way that intelligence was linked with success. Jews were considered outsiders, they were regarded with a certain suspicion. I remember being asked if we had horns by people who you would think would know better. They were a tiny minority who embraced America. Today you might be a poor man, but tomorrow you can become a rich man. During the 19th century, millions of people came to America from all over the world. Many were not welcomed. The Irish and Chinese were routine targets of hostility. Africans brought against their will suffered brutality and unending hardship. Jews met with a mixed reception. Most Americans had never seen a Jew until they met a Jewish peddler. It's a story that's told in many versions, but mine is, what is the difference between a bookkeeper in New York's garment district and a U.S. Supreme Court justice. One generation. These first 19th century Jewish immigrants were fortunate in their timing. America was expanding with new railroads and canals linking far-flung towns and markets together. The Jew is the middleman and he's bringing the material kind of what I might call sort of quasi-luxuries to the farm families and the loggers and the miners. As Americans headed west, Jews went with them, outfitting the western expansion, establishing communities in cities like Cincinnati, St. Louis, Chicago, Des Moines, San Francisco. Soon, there would be Jewish Americans in nearly every state of the Union. My grandfather first came and had a pack on his back. He got his pack from the Baltimore Bargain House, where for $40 you could get a pack. And uh, you would walk, and then pretty soon, you know, you'd get enough money to buy a horse, and then things would get a little better, and you had a wagon, and then you could put more stuff on the wagon. My grandmother called them the rolling store man. What a beautiful phrase. And then soon, you know, they would open a store, and uh, my family lived out this paradigm. 
as did many, many others. I call it the Harvard Business School of German Jews because for about five years, many of them peddled and then they would stop and found a store. And the store often turned into other kinds of businesses. Now my mother's family, the Lehmans, came from Bavaria, settled in Montgomery, Alabama, opened a, a store called Lehman Brothers, and ultimately took payment in cotton, and the Lehmans actually made their fortune for the next century in cotton. Meyer Guggenheim came from Switzerland and made millions mining silver and lead. Levi Strauss, a Bavarian immigrant, made his first fortune outfitting the miners during the gold rush, then took out a patent for making riveted denim pants, and made another fortune selling blue jeans. Jews make up no more than 2 to 3 percent of the American population. They um, make up 50 percent of the top 200 intellectuals, 40 percent of the Nobel Prize winners in science and economics, 20 percent of the professors at the top universities, 40 percent of the partners in the top New York and DC law firms, 59 percent of the writers, directors, and producers of the 50 top grossing movies. 37% uh, of the winners of the National Medal of Science and 50% of the world uh, chess champions. If they knew me, they would know that, that I'm not racist at all. Senator Marty Nolenberg from Troy is defending himself after comments he made during an education committee meeting in Lansing. And you mentioned why these schools fail, and you mentioned, you mentioned, you know, the, you know, the dis economically disadvantaged and, you know, the, you know, um, the non-white population um, are contributors to that. And... You know, we can't fix that. I mean, we can't make an, an African-American white. I mean, that's just, it is what it is. His words came as he talked with representatives from the Department of Education and the governor's office about failing school districts all over the state. Do you see how some people would take that offensively to say you can't make an African-American white? And that, 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 I, I guess, I suppose if they want to, you know, spin words around, I suppose they can do it that way, but... If you read further into my, my questioning, um, I, I don't think you would interpret it that way. Senator Nolenberg says to put it in context, he had just read statistics that said most kids in struggling districts are of color. Now, since he was speaking to the governor's advisors when he made these comments, I reached out to the governor's office to get some context. The governor's deputy press secretary, David Murray, tells me there was no suggestion made that the students' academic performance was caused by their economic status or race or ethnicity. Baker specifically commented that all children are capable of high academic performance in a high performing school. What really screws up a lot of the left's arguments are Asians. Um, if you argue that the teaching methods in our schools today are too Eurocentric for black kids. What explains how well Asians do? 
I mean, if you argue that black kids are being kicked out of or suspended uh, from school for bullying due to racism, what explains the fact that white kids are suspended more than the Asian kids? You made the comment about, uh, you know, education, no child left behind, and uh, the problem schools. Well, I happen to be an education major, and it is my personal belief that there really is no such thing as a problem school. I mean, yes, many schools are underfunded, and yes, inner city schools have trouble retaining qualified, uh, experienced teachers because they would rather teach in the suburbs. Uh, one of the classes I had to take was called multiculturalism in the classroom. And there was a graph about the educational success of different minorities. And the African American community in very low numbers graduates high school and goes on to college uh, in proportion to, to the rest of the country. Now what I noticed right off was this very same graph did not show the Asian community. And this is a community, I see you laughing, this is a community that highly values education. They also value respect. You don't talk back to your teacher, you do your homework and you study. And there are a great many uh, the Asians that I've known personally where the father speaks very little English, has a blue collar job, the mother speaks no English at all. But those children, first generation Americans, okay, their parents were born in another country and they came over here. Those children will go on to become doctors, lawyers, head of business. And yet, we, I'm being told in this class that the reason the African American community doesn't go to college in bigger numbers is because of the slavery issue and all these things were 200 years ago and they start talking about Ebonics. And to me, there seems to be a dichotomy there. Uh, everything you said about the Asian uh, students uh, are pretty much true statistically. I mean, not every Asian student is a brilliant student, but boy, the proportions are high and also the, the speed with which they have uh, assimilated. The story about the, the parent who speaks hardly any English and the kid is valedictorian, that happens all the time. Through an interpreter, this South Philadelphia high school student says he was badly beaten and bruised when a gang of black students attacked him yesterday. Asian community leaders say as many as 30 students were targeted over a two-day period. The attackers were allowed to run in the hallways during um, class time. They were, they were searching class by class looking for um, the Asian students they were looking for. School district officials say there were fights, but that's all they were, just fights. John Chen, executive director of the Chinatown Development Corporation, says out of 70 Asian students, only a fraction showed up for school today. Only 10 students showed up for school today because all the kids are terrified to be in that school at this point in time. They told police why they refused to go back to South Philadelphia High School. We are afraid to get attacked after school and inside school, in the bathroom, around the school, around the hallway in school. And their investigators say 30 Asian American students at South Philadelphia High were assaulted last week by a group of African American students, 10 of whom they say have been suspended and sent to alternative schools. This week, as many as 50 students are boycotting classes because they claim the Philadelphia School District isn't taking the case seriously.
Now, what's going to happen now, what these think tanks decide to do in the contract with America, they found out through their research that approximately 68 to 7% of all the blacks in America work in some level of government. This happened as a direct result of the civil rights movement. See, at the end of the civil rights movement, instead of moving against the problem to get more wealth and power for black folk, our civil rights organizations pushed us over and looking for jobs. And so all of our black folk then, over 50 to 60 percent of all the blacks that got jobs after the civil rights movement went into government. So 68 to 70 percent of all the blacks in America are working either in federal government, city government, state government, county government, libraries, and school systems. So when you hear white folks talking about downsizing government, what they're talking about are de-employing and disemploying black folk. Now, I just told you that 68 to 70 percent of all the black folk are working in government. Uh, 26 to 28 percent of the rest of the blacks are working in white corporations. And those white corporations are going to follow the government. They're going to downsize. You're going to see IBM cutting back uh, 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 Apple computers and Meritech, Lucent Tech. Now, all of them are going to cut back. Only 2% of the blacks in America work in their own stores and their own business and their own communities. Only 2% that are not vulnerable. Only 2% of blacks are not vulnerable. The rest are vulnerable in America. Every major industry in Europe was bankrupt, including steel, coal, and cement, and especially the agrarian companies were hit the hardest. All were bankrupt, and because of American tariffs, the European markets were unable to compete. At the same time, one man was trying to help, Secretary of State George C. Marshall. He was the spokesman for a group of brilliant economists, financiers, and investment bankers trying to come up with a plan to save Europe, the Marshall Plan. The Marshall Plan was first implemented in the United Kingdom. The American government dispatched a committee to the United Kingdom to oversee the distribution of the Marshall Funds and the integration of American technology in the European industries. With the success of the United Kingdom, the Marshall Funds were transferred to France, Belgium, Holland, and the Scandinavian countries. The Technical Assistance Program, which allowed over 3,000 Europeans to make six-month visits to various U.S. industries to learn new techniques. There was also a similar program in agriculture. A Chinese firm carrying out the construction of Nigeria's first standard gauge railway line has started training for local railway personnel to prepare them for the operation of the rail as the project nears completion. The 186.5 km rail will link the capital Abuja to the north central state of Kaduna. Xia Li Jing, a project manager with the China Railway Construction Corporation, says the training covers more than 100 personnel of the Nigeria Railway Corporation. For the construction itself, the track station is almost complete. As what you can see just now, we are starting the operation training. It impacts on agriculture and the economy as agricultural produce are conveyed from Kaduna to Abuja at much cheaper rates. A number of rail projects like this are underway across the country in an attempt to inject life into an economy facing recession and diversify Nigeria's economy from one almost solely reliant on oil. Watson is one of the co-discoverers of DNA. In fact, he was one of the people who discovered DNA structure, and of course that is a very important foundation of the scientific field. Well, recently uh, he made it known to everyone that he will be auctioning off his Nobel Prize 
uh, because he is broke. Now, why is he broke? What happened? Why is he auctioning off this very, very important prize? Well, it turns out that in the past, he made a few racist comments about black people, and now people refuse to hire him as a result. Let me give you the specific examples according to Roth's story. In a 2007 interview with the Sunday Times, Watson claimed that he was inherently gloomy about the prospect of Africa because, quote, all our social policies are based on the fact that their intelligence is the same as ours, whereas all the testing says not really. Uh, he apologized for his remarks, saying that he was not a racist in a conventional way. Oh. And that the journalist interviewing him somehow wrote that I'm worried about people in Africa because of their low IQ, and you're not supposed to say that. Even Bill Gates, even, even Bill Gates, when you when you look at that, like they done sold us like, like they make Bill Gates sound like he came from Compton or Zuckerberg. Exactly. Dude, folks, his daddy was the number, like one of the top trademark attorneys in Seattle. You put that with his computer thing, he was ahead of the game. Most black people are poor or in the working class, like that's poverty. You know, this is what happens when you don't have any inheritance. You don't have any inheritance. We don't have good schools. The, there was a study recently that showed most black people, you know, the majority of the black community go to failing schools. Okay? We don't have any inheritance. We have failing schools. There are no jobs. That means that we're a part of a permanent underclass. David Le Bailly is a gossip reporter with the epitome of superficial journalism in Europe, the Paris Match. He has to stay here as the chronicler of this tragic comedy. It all revolves around France's wealthiest woman, 87-year-old Liliane Betancourt, the heiress of what some call the most famous cosmetics company in the world. Yes, the one with the hairspray. Liliane's daughter, Françoise Betancourt Myers, thinks her mother no longer has all her marbles and that this man is the reason. Françoise Marie Bagnier, the good friend of Madame L'Oréal. Liliane Betancourt is supposed to have given this painter and photographer and bon vivant one billion of her 17 billion euros over the last few years. The daughter thinks the aging gigolo is taking advantage of her mother and she's suing him. He demonstratively says he doesn't care, but things aren't so simple. The point of the whole story is whether an older lady of 87 can indeed conduct her own business anymore. And it's about her whole entourage, who profit from her age and generosity to make so much money. Toffs rely on primogeniture, inheritance by the firstborn son. But from time to time, the lottery of DNA has played havoc with the ideal of seamless transition. Casualties we have come across in this series include Jamie Blandford, <laughs> heir to the largest palace in Britain. He crumpled at the prospect of his inheritance, took to crack, aged just 25, and has only just got clean. Then there's Anthony Ashley Cooper, 10th Earl of Shaftesbury. He couldn't turn round his crumbling Dorset estate and took to drink. He fled to France, fell prey to an escort, Jamila and Barrack. A year later, the hapless Earl's body was discovered in a remote Alpine ravine, murdered at his new wife's instruction. And you come out of a tradition of a people that said we love the least of these, the poor, the orphan, the widow, the fatherless, the motherless, and we 
acknowledge that any time you talk about black folk in America, you're talking about a state of emergency, especially for black poor and working people. Poverty is a horizontal issue. I keep telling some of my civil rights leaders, stay away from poverty. You, can't, you cannot eradicate poverty. Poverty is a fix, it's a given. You're always gonna have poor people. You're always gonna have poor people. You're always gonna have poor people. And people say, well, you're gonna have poor Greeks, poor Indians, poor Lithuanians, poor Hungarians. Quit trying to eradicate poverty and try to get as many black folk as you out and leave poverty alone. But they try to eradicate something that can't be eradicated. To win huge amounts of money in the lottery, you have to be lucky. To keep your life in order after winning that money, you have to be skillful. This is David Lee Edwards. I never have to worry about a hotel room again. Well, I have to pay for it. I never have to worry about a menu. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. Edwards and his then soon-to-be wife Shauna won one quarter of a Powerball jackpot. They were presented with a $41 million check at the ceremony in Louisville, Kentucky in 2001 and received 27 million after taxes. Edwards had served time in prison and was unemployed. They got the Ferrari and many more cars and a Learjet and mansions. In one year, Edwards said he spent $12 million. He ultimately lost all his money, filed for divorce from Shauna and died in hospice care two years ago. His story is not unique. Was this bad judgment or what would you like to say? It to was everybody? bad judgment, bad choice. Do you wanna say a few words, Amanda? The woman not commenting was Amanda Clayton, who won $1 million in the Michigan State Lottery. She got into legal trouble after continuing to collect welfare benefits. She had said she was entitled to welfare because she still needed help. One year after she won the lottery, Amanda Clayton was found dead in her home from a suspected drug overdose. How long have you been here? 19 years. The whole park has changed. You know, this used to be a five-star park. Well, I get 876 a month, and 500 goes to the landlord. Plus, of course, there's electricity and gas, which makes another about 115 a month. You don't have a whole lot for food. What really built the city of Detroit were the things that are the substance of a market system, entrepreneurship and incentive. Uh, if you read the annals of Detroit, especially in the early 20th century, you can tell the, the Henry Fords and, and the suppliers, what came to be the suppliers, Durant, the message was out to all sorts of uh, places in the U.S., upstate New York. Uh, Come to Detroit, that's where you can make your, your living, your fortune. We're getting together essentially what we call today a critical mass. 
of entrepreneurship, invention, and Edison was part of that, and you had so many that tied in to give Detroit its economic preeminence in the 20th century. Henry Ford created the $5 day, and, and cars became affordable to the masses. Production increased, and with the increase in production meant jobs. So you had people moving from all over the country to Detroit for the auto jobs because they, it was much better for them to be in a city and to get a job which paid a steady wage than to be working in the field, which may or may not yield a good harvest some year. So people flocked to the city and it became one of the biggest, most metropolitan communities in the United States, all because of the auto industry. When and how did you come up with the concept? So I got the idea of doing BET when I was uh, helping out a, 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 a guy who was a lobbyist for the cable industry. Uh, I mean, he, he, he was trying to start his own channel. I, I was lobbying for the cable industry. He was a business guy. And he uh, talked to me about his business model, which was a channel for the elderly. And so he had a special kind of data about the elderly buys certain products, the elderly consumes certain products, the elderly has different kind of lifestyles, the elderly is poorly depicted on television, all things that are unique to older people. And he was trying to start that kind of a channel. So I asked him, I, I said, can I borrow your business model? He said, sure. So wherever he had elderly, I crossed it on and put black. Black people have different buying habits, <laughs> black people have different consumption patterns. Black people, uh, you know, watch television in different ways. Black people are not adequately depicted on television. So when you put all of that together, you know, it just said, gee, you know, let's start this channel BET. So I went to this guy named John Malone, who at that time operated the third largest cable system in the country. He liked the idea because he had some cable systems in black communities, and he saw it as a perfect way to add more content for his cable subscribers to sell more cable. And that's how BET got started. Now, how were you able to convince John Malone to actually invest in your company? What steps did you take? Well, well, John, John Malone is a a strong believer in entrepreneurs. Okay. He fundamentally likes the idea of people who have vision or people who have ideas and can and can passionately articulate the idea. He likes to back them. Okay. So I, I was able to convince him because, first of all, he had a small need for the product. I mean, it wasn't ne totally necessary, but he had cable systems that wanted the product. Okay. The second was he believed in entrepreneurs. He, he's not a he's not the kind of investor who believes in government programs. So. Okay. Yeah, you, if you'd gone to him and say, I want to get a government loan, an SBA loan, he probably would have thrown you out of his office. <laughs> but if you go to him and say, I believe this product can work, I believe there's a demand for black content, I believe cable operators want to see more black programming, mm -hmm. and I, I think I can find the content, he bought into the notion. So he put the first half a million dollars into BET, and the rest, as they say, is history. Welcome very, very, very much to this segment of the program. Where we're happy to welcome to the program Bob Johnson. Bob Johnson is the president of the Black Entertainment Television. Bob, welcome very, very much to Conversations. So tell us, Black Entertainment uh, Television, what's it about for the cable television audience? Black Entertainment Television is the nation's first and only cable television satellite network oh. distributing black programming uh, on an advertised-supported basis to about 4.5 million cable households across the nation. Quality program quality black entertainment as we can find. The problem finding quality entertainment, black entertainment programming, is that a problem? I think it is a problem yeah. because as you know there's no uh, production mill, if you will, turning out black programming simply because there's never been a distribution system for black programming because television has to have mass appeal programming so you can't s target it specifically to any particular group. That's black mm -hmm. entertainment television is attempting to open up that distribution system. That's
two seconds away from switching to the redundant sense sequencer. T minus 27 seconds. We have gone for redundant set sequencer start. T minus 20 seconds and counting. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4. We've gone for main engine start. We have main engine start. gentlemen, rock and roll. TV, music television. I'm Alan Hunter. I will be with you right after Mark. We'll be covering the latest in music news coast to coast here on MTV Music Television. I'm Martha Quinn. The music will continue non-stop on MTV Music Television, the newest component of your stereo system. I'll be with you right after Alan. Well, all right, I'm J.J. Jackson, and I'll be sitting in with the latest video music performances the way they were meant to be. That's in stereo on MTV Music Television. You'll never look at music the same way again. Hi, I'm Nina Blackwood, and I'll be with you after J.J. right here on MTV, the world's first video music channel all day, all night, in stereo. MTV presents another exclusive world premiere video. A flock of seagulls continue to soar with their new video, Wishing, from their forthcoming album. Don't wish for more flock of seagulls, just tune in. World premiere video music, Friday night, 10 o'clock Eastern, 7 o'clock Pacific, only on MTV Music Television. I'd like to ask you something. Yeah, we'll you know, all right. Um, it, it occurred to me, having watched MTV over the last few months, um, that it's, it, uh, it's, got a, it's a solid enterprise, but, and it's got a lot going for it. I'm just floored by the fact that there's so, many bl so few black artists featured on it. Why is that? I think that we're trying to move in that direction. We want to play artists that seem to be doing music that fits into what we want to play for MTV. There's th the company is thinking in terms of narrow casting. That's evident. Um, it's evident in the fact that the only few black artists that one does see are on about 2.30 in the morning or, in, or to around 6. Very few are featured predominant, no. predominantly during the day. No, that, uh, that's a... I'll say that over the last couple of weeks these things have been changing, but it, it's, no, uh, it's a I slow process. This is the Video Soul Star of the Week. Star of the Week is sponsored by Kentucky Fried Chicken. Kentucky Fried Chicken. We do chicken right. Prince in the Revolution on Video Soul from France with America. Hey, don't go away. The King of Soul is next. He's in America, too, living in America, as well as information about tomorrow's Video Soul. We'll be right back. More of the 20 hottest videos of the week when Video Soul returns. television network he created. He's since closed that chapter, focusing on his next act. Robert Johnson recently sat down with Ed Gordon, the host of our sister show, Our World with Black Enterprise. Robert Johnson is our power player. He's known as a business visionary, building his fortune and savvy reputation as the owner of Black Entertainment Television. 
After the sale of the successful cable network in 2000, Bob Johnson became America's first black billionaire. Now his empire is made up of hotels, a pro sports franchise, and a bank. Emmett McHenry is a visionary known for his legendary ability to successfully unite communication with computer technology in groundbreaking ways. Emmett is a quintessential pioneer. He brings together innovative spirit, creative design, an absolute fearlessness, and a huge affection for the human spirit. Emmett's own career spans the array, from corporate America to military service, academia to entrepreneur. Emmett is often on the leading edge of advancing computer technologies, which makes his insights and involvement in startup companies like the software innovator Semantic Labs a true value in a competitive economy. He's, you know, out in the community um, talking about technology. He's uh, being a good role model, and uh, he's been one of the four founders as far as technology is concerned in the United States. some of the most brilliant black people on the planet right here among us but we've been caught up in corporate America in academia in other areas and we are not thinking and planning for the masses and if this brilliant uh, black professional and academicians started thinking on what their gifts and skills and talents could be, how they could be used to advance the masses, then we could come up with a program that would not only lift the few, but lift the whole. And that should be our next effort is to turn the learning, turn the, the professional class, turn the business class. Those that have done so well, now can we come up with a program that will put black men to work? Can we come up with a program that instead of drugs and guns being in the community, but we? who have been blessed in some way to move ahead in the society can turn our effort toward lifting the little man in the hood. And if we do that, then we can reverse the horror of what we presently see. Let me be brutally frank about this. The kids who are gifted in this country are the kids who are going to 
determine the success or failure of our future. The kids who are gifted in this country are the kids who are going to determine the success or failure of our future. And for us to neglect them, as we are doing, it is terrible. We are focusing enormous resources on the kids who have learning problems, and we are at the same time pulling back resources from and making life more difficult for those kids who are gifted. as African Americans are great consumers. We're the best consumers on the face of this planet. We tweet, we Instagram like nobody's business. But are we putting ourselves in a position to take advantage of all that tweet and Instagram? And they, we all, but we both know the answer. We all know the answer. The answer is no. The different places, like I mentioned, you know, uh, in the past, you know, Google, Yahoo, Netscape, places like those, and it's a lot of a lot of uh, Caucasian Americans, very few African Americans besides the folks that are cooking the food, guarding the doors, and mopping the floors, unfortunately, and a lot of Asians and, and Indians. We've been afforded this luxury called Google and YouTube. Anything and everything that you ever want to know is in, not, in, not at your fingertips, it's in your pocket. Learning HTML, CSS, JavaScript, those are fundamentals of website development. Take on a little freelance job, throw a little ad on Craigslist, say, hey, you know what? I'll do a little website for you for $500, right? Do a little website, you know how long it takes, how many burgers you gotta flip to make $500? It's gonna take you a few weeks to make $500. You can knock that out in about four days for a talented web developer, you know what I'm saying? So. That's the beginnings of what you can do if you have that skill set. The problems out there are real, but the solutions are even realer. And I push back and I don't make apologies for the way I feel because we as black folk need, need to open our eyes up, recognize the opportunity and seize them damn opportunities. When the, the damn excuses, leave them damn excuses to somebody else, seriously. This whole contract with white America is, is, is not anti-liberalism, it is not anti-democratic party, it wasn't even anti-Clinton. What it was, it was an, they were trying to answer a question that's been haunting white, white America for about 37 years. And that is, what do you do with 36 million obsolete black folk? That's what the contract was for. But now, as I told you, is that blacks are obsolete, they don't need your kids anymore. They don't need half-educated kids anymore. The third thing that's going to hurt us and push us into this underclass structure is technology. You got blacks running all over the country telling black folks and people, well, what we're going to do, we can overcome racism, we get involved in technology. Won't happen. Technology has never been a friend and ally of black folk. It has always been our worst enemy. Why has it been? Because you see, tech racism has always kept us in our place. And technology has always come along and run over that place. That's why technology has always been our enemy. See, when you keep a black man as the porter, and all of a sudden you come along with a floor sander, he's gone. You keep him as the elevator operator, and you put a computer in the, in the elevator. You keep him as the dishwasher, and you get an automatic dishwasher. You all understand what I'm telling you? So when black people come to you telling you, well, you get technology, no, 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 you said no. What we have to do is to get control of, get behind technology so to stop running over us.
And that's why right now in Washington, D.C., the Office of Technology's last report says that the people going to be hurt most by technology are going to be black folk. And a fellow named Jeremy Rickman has a book out called The End of Work. And he is the director of the National Economic Trends for Washington, D.C. and nationally. He's the guy to put out these trends. He put a book out. And his book, Chapter 5, talks about what technology is going to do to people. And he uses black folk as an example. And I went and sat down and talked with him. And what he says to Dr. Anderson, he said, they, they, my publishers tried to make me take that chapter out of the book. He said, I fought to keep it in. He said, because technology is going to kill black folk. And, he, and then read that book, and that's what he's talking about. He says, because black folk don't have any control of technology, you don't own anything. Says Uber plans to allow people to order self-driving cars from their phones. Ford now says it will have a fully driverless sedan ready to roll in just five years. Hooray and the opposite of hooray. Hooray because technology always brings more productivity, pleasure, and autonomy to our lives. A driverless car reduces human error, the culprit behind a major killer, the car crash. As for distracted teens and drunks, their hands won't be behind the wheel. This book is packed with all kinds of interesting information that I had never heard before. This really jumped out at me. You talk about the grotesque, really, disparity between black and white unemployment rates. The black unemployment rate is much higher than the white unemployment rate, but you say that wasn't always the case. You say black labor force participations were higher than that of whites up until about 1930. What yes. changed? Uh, blacks from the South construction workers were coming up north and the construction companies were able to underbid the northern companies and uh, get government contracts and so this was meant to put a stop to that so just to be totally clear up until 1930 under the Roosevelt administration and or I, of course that would have been the Hoover administration but up until that point there were lower unemployment rates in black neighborhoods than white neighborhoods and that has been the result, do you think, of lack not, of government intervention? Not, not always, but in 1930, that was certainly the case, and that was not the first time that it was the case. 1866, and uh, and up to about 19, into the 1920s, black folk had the greatest economic achievement they've ever had in this country. Even though even under, if it didn't occur under integration, it occurred under segregation. Those black folk had, had managed to acquire over 20 million acres of land. In, according to the United States Census in 1920. 20 million acres of land. But between 1920s and 1950s, they lost almost all of it. Back in the 1920s and up to the 1940s, we had black broom factories, we had black mattress factories. Almost every black major city had at least two cab companies. We had, uh, we had black bus companies, we had black shipyard up here in Baltimore. And when I say black bus lines, I'm not talking about just having three or four buses. 
we had over 500 buses. And, our, and this is in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. And our bus, our bus company didn't just service just the black neighborhoods, it serviced the blacks and the white neighborhoods. We had two black cab companies. We had the Harris Cab Companies and the Campbell City Cab Companies. But they used to have their own restaurants, they had the best nightclubs in the country. The black blacks had two baseball leagues. Each baseball league had eight teams. We had over 500 of the best baseball players in the world. But what did they do? They wanted to integrate. So as soon as they put Jackie Robinson with the, with the, with the, uh, on, the, on the Brooklyn Dodgers, black folks said, we'll give up all of our black baseball leagues, black teams, and all our black players, and we can just get one black boy to play on a white team. Oddly enough, it was the black press that pushed for a more formalized, structured baseball operation. Rube Foster would become the architect of that. He was brilliant. He's the gentleman who started, he started the it. Negro Leagues. He started it. Yeah, yeah, this is Rube Foster, uh, without question, the greatest baseball mind this game has ever seen. He was also a very rich man. When Rube Foster started the Negro Leagues in 1920, over 400,000 black folks went to those games. You know, so this was a very thriving baseball enterprise. Well, it broke up the Negro League in uh, about, let's see, he, they, they got him in 46. He got called up to the majors in 47. And mm, 56, there was no more uh, Negro League. The barbershop has always been a staple in black life and one of the few black owned businesses that survived losing the Negro Leagues. Because if there's a bittersweet aspect to the overall story, it lies in the fact that you can directly parallel the rise and fall of the Negro Leagues with the rise and fall of black economy. You can directly parallel the rise and fall of the Negro Leagues with the rise and fall of black economy in this country. And to a large extent, black economy never recovered from losing the Negro Leagues. I believe that with three quarters of a trillion dollars coming through our hands, if we summon our economists, our bankers, our entrepreneurs, our economic thinkers, we can come up with a plan to create jobs and keep some of that money revolving in our community more than one time, two times, three times, four times, then we can build institutions that speak to our needs. Black Patriarch.